Welcome back, everybody. We're coming to you from, I don't know why I'm saying we, I'm coming to you from Uber Studios, the only place that you've ever seen me up till now. Uh, your host here, Uber Mormon. I'm going to go over a video that I think will be quick today. Uh, this was earth shattering for me when I left the church. So I'll give some context really quick. I was a member my whole life. I'm from Salt Lake City, Utah. I served a mission from 2014 to 2016, from um, July to July. And uh, yeah, I left the church when I was 23-ish. I'm now 27. Um, and I, let me tell you, it wasn't a fun process. Maybe I'll get into the reasons that eventually caused me to leave. But right now, I'm just trying to create videos that would have been so helpful for me when I was in that super, super vulnerable place. Uh, a little more context. I, my wife... <clears throat> a little more context. I got married in 2018. I left the church physically in 2018. I ruminated on it. I kind of wrapped my brain around it. I mentally left the church in 2019, which uh, then caused a crazy depression to come over me uh, until about 2021. So there, let's just say there were a lot of things that have been helpful to me as I pull myself out of that weird depression that um, losing my faith put me in. And I know a lot of LDS people will think, of course you were depressed, you left the one true church. Well, I'm not going to go after that so much in this video, but um, I am working on a video that does a better job of explaining what really happens when you lose kind of your orienting um, center point in your cognitive and psychological maps. That is what is really happening. And that is what fills you with negative emotion and anxiety and um, existential dread is um, losing essentially the top piece of your pyramid that was giving meaning to all the pieces beneath it. And so um, I'm not going to talk about that really in depth in this video. Um, it is, it is related to this video. And as I was studying for that video, I realized this is going to be too long. The thinker I'm going to go over today is kind of too intense for one video. And so we're going to break, we're going to break them up a little bit. So the person we're talking about today is James Fowler. He was crucial to my kind of recovering from losing my mind. And so if you haven't heard of James Fowler, he's a great thinker to look into. He's hard to read. And so um, I'm hoping that this video all by itself will kind of just give you some of the key points. And then if, if you're not a reader or if um, cracking open a book by like a 1980s Baptist theologian slash human development psychologist sounds daunting to you, you don't have to. We'll do it right here. We'll do it together. It'll be awesome. So we're going to go over the thesis of this book, Stages of Faith. And it's really important before we really do this, um, before we really crack into the stages of faith, I want to kind of go over what Fowler means by faith, because he doesn't mean what you and I typically mean when we talk about faith. Um, essentially, for Fowler, faith is the map on which you, you see your life progressing. And religion is the thing toward which you see your life progressing. <sighs> Gonna try not to make this very complicated. Paul Tillich, gr another great theologian, existentialist, um, guy from Germany. Same, I believe, if I remember correctly, he's from the same town that Friedrich Nietzsche was from. Uh, Frederick Nietzsche, as we all know, is the reason that I'm named Uber Mormon. Um, 
so Paul Tillich from the same city, or at least I think area in Germany that uh, Nietzsche was from. And Paul Tillich, about when he was talking about religion, he said, religion is that which is of ultimate concern. And so let's imagine our lives for a second. We're going to go into this more in another video, but let's imagine that our lives for a second is, is being aimed toward something. We're in Google Maps and we've decided to pick a destination. The destination that the destination that I would pick for myself um, would then influence all of the little baby steps that go in between here and there. So for example, if I want to be a psychologist, then that would change my day-to-day -day life in a very different direction than if I were to try and become a stand-up comedian, right? So you, you kind of see that you're gearing your life and you're building your life with the end in mind. And, and we're starting and we're starting with the end in mind. In the same way that you go on Google Maps, you say, take me to this destination, and then it, it tells you every step of the way till you get there. And so your religion is the thing at the top of that pyramid. It's the thing at the end of your Google Maps destination. And so if you take that away, you're faced with anxiety. You're faced with nihilism. Suddenly, there's no, air, there's no point that you are geared toward. There's nothing, any step is simultaneously the right step and the wrong step because there is no destination in mind. And so for Fowler, faith is that meaningful map that you're kind of occupying in, in your psychological, with your ego, if that makes sense. I hope that I'm doing a good job explaining this. So now that I've explained that, I'm going to go over what his six stages of faith actually are. And uh, this, like I said at the beginning, this was earth shattering for me. This was really helpful for me to learn. And it made me feel like I wasn't crazy. It made me feel incredibly validated. So I hope that this video can do the same for some of you who are in the same place that I was back in 2020, 2019 and uh, the beginning of 2021. Okay, I'm going to take my sweater off now and I have to leave me saying this in the video. Otherwise, I'm gonna have some sort of strange continuity error and then everybody's gonna make fun of me and they're gonna be like, Uber Mormon, your videos are so bad. In the middle of the, in the beginning of the video, you're wearing a gray sweater and then you're not wearing a gray sweater. You're such an idiot. You didn't even like fix that seam by talking about it. You have to at least mention it in your dialogue, you piece of shit. Anyway, so sweater's coming off. Okay, let's jump into my computer. There is intuitive projective, mythic literal, synthetic conventional. That sounds like a type of oil change, but it's not. Individuative reflexive, conjunctive faith, universalizing faith. Okay, I'm going to read these quickly. And um, in, the, in the description, I'm going to link to a PDF with all of these again. So you can come back and watch this video as many times as you'd like, or you can save the PDF on your phone or something and just kind of go over it in your spare time. It is worth a second read. Okay, stage one. So this is the um, intuitive projective stage. This is the stage of preschool children in which fantasy and reality often get mixed together. However, during this stage, our most basic ideas about God are usually picked up from our parents and or society. Okay, I don't feel like there's a lot that I need to explain here. It's very simple. Essentially, fantasy and reality get mixed together. You're, you're picking up ideas from culture about who God is. You're probably also believing in Santa Claus. You're in stage one. Okay, stage two. When children become school age, they start understanding the world in more logical ways. They generally accept the stories told to them by their faith community, but tend to understand them in very literal ways. A few people remain in this stage through adulthood. I want to take a quick break after this, and I want to mention something that's a little bit fascinating to me as somebody who is interested in um, the psychology of, of human development. Um, Fowler based these six stages, they actually mesh very nicely onto Erickson's stages of development and Piaget's stages of development. And I, I actually do want to go over a 
few different things that Erickson talked about. I probably won't talk about Piaget on this channel, um, even though he's a he's a great thinker. But in terms of like how Fowler has mapped himself onto Piaget here, stage two is kind of following pretty well with uh, what Piaget would have called pre-operational, which is, um, you know, it's, it's this. Um, we accept the stories that are told to us by our faith, and we're trying to find like logical ways to map it on. And so maybe like believing in Noah's Ark as a real thing would would still be the case for somebody in stage two. Or maybe believing in Adam and Eve as literal people would still be something that is going on for somebody in stage two. Too. So they're they're trying to understand, okay, well, he's talking about a boat. I, I can imagine a boat. I can imagine a boat being real, so it must have been real. Boom. No notion that maybe these are mythological stories. The, it actually, the, the part in quotes here, or the part in brackets here, actually makes me a little bit sad. A few people remain in this stage throughout adulthood. That makes me sad. Stage three. Most people move on to this stage as teenagers. At this point, their life has grown to include several different social circles, and there is a need to pull it all together. When this happens, a person usually adopts some sort of all-encompassing belief system. However, at this stage, people tend to have a hard time seeing outside their box, and don't even recognize they are inside a belief system. At this stage, authority is usually placed in individuals or groups that represent one's beliefs. This is the stage in which many people remain. Okay, so this this stage is interesting. So we're we're starting to see cliques, we're starting to see groups, we're starting to put people together into other containers with people who we believe are similar to them. And now we can just for simplicity's sake you have the jocks in high school, right? And um, you don't need to know any of the individuals in that group to know how to interact with them. You interact with them as jock. And so we're, we're creating avatars. We're creating archetypes. We're interacting with the world in much more simple blobs instead of interacting with, with one-off individuals. And authority is very important here. This is the stage in which many people remain. I think this is where I was until I started to kind of question my Mormon roots. And I think this is where a lot of active Mormons remain. This is my opinion, right? Nobody get offended by this, but this is my opinion that active Mormons, the ones who aren't still in stage two, most of them land here. I'm going to throw out 70% because uh, at this stage, authority is placed on individuals or groups that represent one's beliefs. So I can't think of a more obvious red flag or giveaway for this stage and Mormonism than that. Essentially, the prophet is the guy. Everything that he says is true and I will believe it. And so, um, yeah, stage three is fascinating for those reasons. Let's move on to stage four. Okay, trigger warning. Stage four is going to feel like it's talking about you. It's going to feel like James Fowler is a fly on your wall and he's been staring at you all night while you're sleeping and it's really, really creepy and you're like, hey, dude, get out of my room. I knew I shouldn't have left the window open. I'm closing it tomorrow night, but seriously, get out of here because this is creepy how much it actually follows the whole like Mormon faith journey leaving the church uh, archetype and structure and all of that. It's very, very uh, incredible, actually. It starts. <laughs> this is a tough stage. You're damn right, James. Often begun in young adulthood. When people start seeing outside the box and realizing there are other boxes, they begin to critically examine their beliefs on their own and often become disillusioned with their former faith. Ironically, the stage three people usually think that stage four people have become backsliders, when in reality, they have actually moved forward. Do you feel seen? You're moving forward. The fact that you now notice that you were in a box and that you were putting the world in a box and that there is no box means that you are taking steps forward and starting to notice you're, you're starting to notice that, hey, that kid James from the that jock group that I used to just indiscriminately hate, he's actually a nice guy. I should treat him as an individual. I wonder if there are other people in that group who are actually nice who I should have given a chance. I wonder if these groups maybe don't exist at all. 
this is the matrix, right? This is that part in the matrix when that little girl, they're at like the the uh, Oracle's house, I think that was her name. They're at the Oracle's house and Neo is sitting with that girl and she's bending the spoon and she's and he's like, how are you doing this? And she, and she says, it's not that hard. You just have to realize the truth. And then he says, what is the truth? And she says, there is no spoon. There are no boxes, everybody. There's no box. There's no box to put yourself in. There's no box. Those boxes that everybody else is in, you put them in those boxes. You can take them away. And so the thing that I find so fascinating about this step, this stage rather, is that stage three people are going to think that you are failing and that you are backsliding, right? How many of us have felt that way from our Mormon family and friends, right? You're regressing. You're losing your faith. I'm not losing anything. I'm seeing the world as it truly is. And I'm starting to lose these filters that I've been conditioned to have. Stage five. It is rare for people to reach this stage before midlife. This is the point when people begin to realize the limits of logic and start to accept the paradoxes of life. They begin to see life as a mystery and often return to sacred stories and symbols but this time without being stuck in a theological box. So this is fascinating for me. This is, this is the point at which, well, I actually don't think that I could say it any better than this. Stage five and stage six, in my opinion, are, are really beautiful. I want to say one thing. Returning to sacred stories and symbols does not mean we are going to go back and forget about all the ways that Joseph Smith abused his power. And it does not mean that we are going to forget about all the ways that the current church has abused its members. We're not going to forget about that. We're going, those, those are boxes. Those are, those are not important. Those are, those are nothing in the grand scheme of things. Um, I think what it's telling us here is that it's okay if we reset ourselves and say, you know what, that destination that I was aimed at before, the one where I was focused on my family, the one where I was concerned about having quality of life instead of quantity of things, that's an okay destination. I would like to aim at that same place as before, but I don't need all of this baggage in my trunk as I do it. I don't need this dogmatism to follow me while I reach my goals. I think that's what it's saying. And so don't feel like, I'm not trying to tell anybody how to feel, right? Feel however you want to feel. For me, what this says is, wherever you wanted to go before, it's okay if you still want to go there. But you don't need to bring the dogmatism with you. You don't need that rigidity with you. You can have a more nuanced take on life. You can, you can believe in God or you can drop God. It doesn't matter. So that is a, a beautiful sentiment to me. Stage six. Few people reach this stage. Those who do live their lives in full service of others without any real worries or doubts. Now, something that strikes me about these six stages is they, there was a lot of commentary for me, it felt like. Uh, there was a lot of explaining, a lot of thinking about kind of two, three, and four. But five, six, and one are very cut and dry. They're very simple. And this is kind of symbolic for me that we start our lives as very simple children and people who complete their cycle of development. It's not that you go from point A to point B. It's that you, you really do the hero's journey here and you start in the Shire and you conquer and you question and you overcome. And then maybe you can return to the Shire, but as this new person who's overcome so much. So this is, this is me kind of riffing on the idea that Jesus said to become as the little children. Um, and whether Jesus is real or not really doesn't matter in, in any case for me. When, when we're told or when it says in the Bible, become as a little child, maybe it's, hey, just remember the really simple stuff and you can drop all that baggage while you're down here. Just aim at what's beautiful and just aim at what is good. And um, 
I think if we do that, we'll live our lives without any real worries or doubts, as Fowler says here. So I hope that that was helpful. It was revolutionary for me when I left the church and came across this PDF. And um, I wanted to kind of put it in an audio format and uh, make it more accessible for people. So I hope you've enjoyed it. If you like this kind of content, go ahead and do the stuff that YouTubers tell you to do. If you don't like this content, you know, just like remove it from your watch history and, and go take a bath or something. So uh, yeah, I hope you all have a great day and uh, we'll, we'll be seeing each other.